It's a funny place to be, stuck in a seemingly mundane world with an inner knowing that the universe is so much more than our mortal minds can comprehend. Yet we all have the capacity to know peace and our oneness with the wholeness of life. And through these interviews, discussions, and reflections, it is my intention to share this possibility. I'm Ryan Kurzak, and this is the Kriya Yoga Podcast. Okay, so the next set of questions is based on the student-teacher uh, relationship in this in spirituality, and especially in the Kriya Yoga tradition. You come from a long lineage of uh, student-teacher uh, relationship. I don't know how to put it. Yes. Uh, okay, so uh, my first question is basically, you have a very structured program in the Kriya Yoga Apprenticeship Program. But what was your experience in the initial days as a student of, of uh, Kriya Yoga, as a student of Mr. Davis? Because this is pre-YouTube, materials were not easily available. So can you talk about your own experience? Yeah, uh, it is very different. And you're right. And I've, I've thought about this a lot even recently when I, when I think about just myself alone. I know there's other teachers as well, but myself alone, the number of videos that are available at youtube.com slash Yoga online, all, all the material that's available. Uh, n- there was material available when I was learning, but it's nothing like what is available now. Yeah. Um, my experience w- was not structured. Um, mm-hmm. Essentially what happened was when I first became in, in interested in meditation, I, I had been for, well, probably since I was in high school, but I began to more seriously pursue it when I was in college and um, I began taking um, a, a yoga class, Hatha yoga class in town. It was one of the first of its kind here in, in rural West Virginia. And um, the teacher knew I was interested in, in meditation. So she said, well, you need to read the book Autobiography of a Yogi. Mm-hmm. I said, okay, I'll read Autobiography of a Yogi. So I remember going to the mall when malls were things to go to. <laughs> and uh, I believe I actually went there with my mom. And um, she went to go get her hair done, and I, I went to the uh, the bookstore, and I found it. But I didn't have any cash on me, so my mom bought it for me. And uh, I read it, and uh, I thought, wow, well, this is it. This is exactly what I've been looking for. I, there was just a sense of, okay, th- this is the path. And, and when I read the book, you see, I didn't have any history, or I didn't have any knowledge of this whole tradition and how it worked. Uh, you know, I was thinking of very much like um, like a, a, a typical American. I thought, oh, well, it's just something you learn. Someone teaches it to you, fine. Like, I didn't have this big idea of you must meet the guru, savior, figure who will bestow upon you this mythical knowledge. Like, I didn't have any of that. It was just, I want to learn this. Um, and so I, I began meditating and I asked the yoga teacher, I said, well, can you initiate me? Because I thought yoga teachers can do that. So she must be able to do that. And she said, no, no. She says, you either have to go to California where Self-Realization Fellowship is, or one of Yogananda's students, um, Roy Eugene Davis, has a center in um, Lake Mont, Georgia. Now, that was about six to eight hours away. I had never really been that far from my home before at this point in time, never drove that far by myself. Oh, that's a long way. And I definitely wasn't going to California because that was all the way across the country. Um, and I decided, no, you know what? I'm going to go. I don't care. I'm just going to go. So I, I, I contacted Center for Spiritual Awareness. I said, I'd like to come and be initiated. Uh, Roy actually responded to me and said, okay, uh, here are the dates that, that you can come. I believe it was August, August 17th, if I recall correctly, was when I was initiated in 2000. I'm just going to double check here just for fun. Uh, 2000, August, yeah, August 17th. That would have been a Thursday. So I mean, then I drove down to Center for Spiritual Awareness on August 13th, 2000, Sunday. And I arrived. And, it, okay, I had my guest room. I had a, someone there with me uh, sharing the guest room. I explored the meditation hall. I thought this is interesting. But, again, I at this point in time, I still didn't have that whole – mythological legendary thing going on that many people have about Kriya Yoga and Yogananda. Um, And then I saw on the paper that I'm supposed to be in the meditation hall at 6 a.m. on Monday morning for a half hour meditation. Okay, I can do that. So I I got there around 545, um, sat down in the middle aisle and I started meditating. It was dark. And then I heard the door creak open. 
in the back of the room at the meditation hall. And I'm sitting there, I open my eyes, I'm just watching now. And I see this tall figure sort of lit up by the street light outside, walk up to the, um, the altar and he, he lit a candle. And then he took a stick of incense and lit it and then waved the lighted incense stick in front of the pictures of Babaji, Lahiri Messiah, Sri Yukteswar, Jesus at that time, and then Paramahansa Yogananda. And I immediately started crying. I'm just, I don't know what happened. I just became overwhelmed by emotion. I'm just trying my best not to make a whole bunch of noises, but tears are running down my face. And it's like, I knew, okay, this is it. It was just, it all came together in that moment. I don't know why, I just knew. And uh, he led us through a chant, Om Namah Shivaya, to us to open our hearts and our minds to the infinite and meditate in a certain way. And I did. And then at the end, um, I went up to introduce myself and uh, I was just trying to be appropriate and I stuck out my hand to shake his hand and he just looked at me and he just gave me a big hug. He said, well, I'm glad you showed up. I said, okay. I, I'm not, I wasn't a hugger at the time, so I wasn't <laughs> sure what to do with that. Plus he was probably, it seemed like two feet taller than me. <laughs> <laughs> so I just got squished in, you know, into his chest and, um, and that's how it started. And I started going to the uh, lectures every day and meditating every day. And when he would talk, it was as though I just understood what he was saying. He just would talk about Kriya Yoga, his experiences, how to do this, how to organize your life. And I thought to myself, oh, great, that's it. This is what I do. Yeah. And then I went home after a week of that, and I just started doing what he said to do. Um, that was it. And then Every now and then I'd send him questions and he'd respond. And then I'd try to go back at least three to four times a year for other retreats or, or visits. But other than that, it was just me and uh, reading the books, meditating every day, doing my best to figure out what they meant and, and doing it. Um, and that, that went on for a long time. And even after uh, Mr. Davis and I became more personally close and I was ordained in, as a Center for Spiritual Awareness minister and Kriya Yoga teacher. And I would visit with him personally in the chalet for a couple hours at a time. And we would just talk. But even when we visited, he wasn't saying, how are you doing, Jyoti Mudra? You know, he was talking about something he saw on the farm channel last night or something. Uh, and, and that's how it went. However, when I want to do something, I figure out how to do it and I do it. Yeah. I'm, I'm very good at teaching myself stuff and doing it well, because when I think something's important, I just decide that's what I'm going to do, and I'm going to figure out how to do it. Um, so my, my training was very loose, but I think it was because I just, I just listened to what Mr. Davis said, and that was it. I didn't make a big deal about it. Um, when it came to the, uh, the Kree Yoga Apprenticeship Program, by that time, that was about maybe four or five years ago as of 2020 when I first came up with this idea. By that time, um, I had worked with a lot of students, both at um, retreat centers, uh, yoga classes, online, um, you name it. I've worked with a lot of students. And I recognized that many students, uh, they jumped around a lot. Like they didn't, they weren't real settled. They didn't really know how to just kind of, many of them weren't self-motivated meaning they didn't know just how to do something and do it. So that's why I created such structure within the program because I wanted people to have an experience to where there was absolutely no question about what they're supposed to be doing. I feel that if you go through the two-year program, year one goes through the Bhagavad Gita, which, I, which is the basis for understanding how one develops spiritually speaking. And year two, we go through the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, which goes really deeply into the specific non-theological or theosophical, theological probably, philosophy of it, just what needs to be done. And so my sense was that if people get a lesson once a week and they're able to apply that over the course of two years, by the time they get done with that two-year program, if they don't know what they're supposed to be doing, well, that's totally out of my hands at that point. So I made the method and the, the, the program structured the way it is so that there was absolutely no question about what you were supposed to be doing. And those people who need that seem to benefit very well from it. And those people who don't need it, um, well, they just enjoy participating. So it seems to work both ways. Yeah. 
No, I totally get it. Like I'm a teacher myself and I tell my student in the beginning of a semester that I'll give you every material possible. I will help you in whatever way I can. But in the end, you have to do the work. If you want right. to get an A, it's up to you. Right. So, yeah, that's totally I don't totally get it. As as a, as, a, <laughs> as a fellow teacher. <laughs> right. And you know, the the whole point was Mr. Davis was very clear in his instruction. I mean, there there was no question about what he wanted or there was no question about how he thought it should work. It was very clear. There was no con- confusing fantasy or or uh, mystical terminology. It was very straightforward. And I found that to be extremely helpful and extremely useful. And so it's been my intention to continue <laughs> to continue that process so people again know exactly what needs to be done for this to work. And no, I agree with that because that was one of the reason I was uh, you know, uh, interested in the program because my mind doesn't work that way. If you start talk, throwing these technical terms at me, I will uh, you'll lose me. I will stop paying attention. I, right. That's just not how my mind works. So because your lectures are already seen in your YouTube videos and everything, it was so simple and easy to understand and you can actually you know apply it in your daily life that was the reason why i decided to apply for the apprenticeship program absolutely right. yes okay so the next question is about uh, you know your relationship with mr davis and sometimes you've mentioned that there was few thing that mr davis said that you didn't quite agree with at that time but you uh-huh. you know later on you realized no no he was right because right. you <laughs> Tell me about one of such experience that you had. Yeah, and when I say I didn't agree with him, it it, it never was uh, a disagreement on yogic philosophy or how the process needed to be done. It was never anything like that. Um, the, the disagreements we had, or the things that I kind of scratched my head and, and uh, wondered about, uh, were, were were more mm, life, just life things. Uh, one thing that I always I had a little bit of difficulty with was in the very beginning, while I understood exactly why Roy did what he did and why he said we did and why he presented the way he did. Um, after about 10 years, uh, he decided that we should start a um, meditation center, an actual in-person center funded by CSA uh, in Asheville, North Carolina, where uh, we had just moved about two years earlier. And um, Mr. Davis was a no nonsense, yeah. cut your hair, wear a suit and a tie kind of person. He he approached the teaching almost in a business kind of fashion. And I I responded well to that because I like I like the no nonsense. Yeah. Um, but there we were in Asheville, North Carolina, where you can't walk around the corner without running into a Reiki master, a shaman, a guru, or uh, someone chanting mantras on the street. So it was very much a a new age kind of place. Um, And so when we set up this center, he told me, he said, look, he says, it's going to be just like we do it here at CSA. You're going to have a talk on Sunday morning. You're going to have a silent meditation. And then at other days, you will teach classes on these topics. Mm -hmm. And um, I I, I personally am fine with that. However... I know that there are already 20 other centers in Asheville, North Carolina, (laughs) and they're all doing, you know, they're doing group study sessions and they're doing uh, kirtan sessions where everyone just gets all caught up in their devotion and their divine love. And they're doing all these things to help keep people uh, in there. And I tried to explain, I said, you know, Roy, (laughs) this is Asheville. I want to see this thrive but this business approach probably isn't going to work. Meaning I don't think we're going to get enough people coming to the center because they're going to, most people are bored. They don't really, their attention span is too short. <laughs> uh, and he just said, I don't care. You know, this is, this is how we teach it. Yeah. And um, I disagreed in, in that sense because I didn't think that the center was going to work if we did it that way. And there were a couple of times when I kind of, took my own initiative (laughs) 
<laughs> and and tried to schedule things that were a little more appealing to the community. And I remember going down to CSA after that, and he'd say, did I say you could do that? Oh. <laughs> and, he, and he would say, I told you, <laughs> this is the way we're going to do it. And since he, they were paying the bills, you know, of course, I should have been listening to him. Uh, so anyway, that was something I, I, I disagreed with. However, as time went on, I then realized truly why he wanted it to be that way. Yeah. Because if you treat it that way, then you are only really truly going to attract the people that want to do the work that don't need to be entertained, that don't need to be distracted by a whole bunch of other stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and so as the years went on, uh, I began to realize that, you know, now, yes, I'm following in Roy's pattern in that regard because I understand why he did it that way. Mm -hmm. And um, I, you know, I don't, I don't care to entertain people anymore. Mm -hmm. So that was one thing where there was a, a, a bit of a difference early on. Mm -hmm. um, another thing, um, when I first got involved in meditation, yogic philosophy, I, I took it all in hook, line, and sinker. I mean, I was just, when you talk about non-attachment, I was like, sure, I'm not attached to anything. <laughs> So much so that I remember foolishly when I was uh, probably in my early 20s, uh, my wife's grandfather had passed away that she loved dearly. Right. And, you know, I should have just been that supportive husband that was there grieving with her, crying with her, letting her process that. But what did I do? Well, I became the little asshole that was like, well, you know, death isn't real. And, uh, <laughs> And what really dies, the, the body dies, the real self doesn't die. And I was pulling that. And, um, and that, was, that was wrong. I don't think that's appropriate in any way. If people are grieving, just grieve with them and remain established in the self internally. Mm -hmm. And that's all you need to do. But um, I, I, I bought all that. But eventually, having gone to massage school, spent more time in Asheville, people kept telling me things like, you just need to be more caring and compassionate. You need to get more involved in life. And so I started doing that. I started being more, I started being more normal in regards to uh, emotional responses and these sorts of things. And then uh, every now and then when I would have uh, maybe, uh, I, like I had a problem in, in my marriage one time, it was just a normal mar marital issue. And I went to Roy thinking he's my spiritual teacher. He's almost, he's 70, 80 years old. He's been married. He, he knows what it's like. So maybe he'll have some good advice for me he just ignored it <laughs> he just looked at me and said well i guess you better just deal with that and move on and here i am thinking come on man you're my you're my you're like my father figure you're yeah. you're, you're you're my you're my, my 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 point of wisdom you need to teach me how to get through this and i started thinking well he's just he really is cold and aloof isn't he <laughs> but then as time went on i started recognizing that you know We've got stuff we've got to deal with. Right. And yes, we've got emotional problems from time to time. But spiritually speaking, that's just a drop in the bucket. You know, he, he wasn't there to be my, my love coach. He wasn't <laughs> there to be my fix, you know. And, right. and he actually, uh, it was an interview with Ryan Strong, uh, mm -hmm. who's also a CSA minister. Yeah. Ryan Strong said that he wrote to him one time asking about career advice. And Roy just wrote back and said, I'm not a career counselor. Yeah, I, I, I heard that one. Yes. Yeah. I heard that podcast. Yes. And, and so when that was going on, I thought to myself, you know, that's not how a teacher should be. Mm. But then as time went on and I started interacting more and more with people, I started realizing that the role of the spiritual teacher, mm. sure, if they have skills in counseling or skills in marital mediation, okay, you can talk to them. But if their, their role is to teach you how to meditate well and how to, how to understand yogic philosophy, if one needs marital counseling or how to improve their business or they need to find a life coach or a business coach or, or, or a therapist. Mm -hmm. um, so the other difference I had was thinking that the whole uh, relationship with Roy was supposed to be almost like a, a family-oriented father figure type role when really that's not the role of the spiritual teacher. Mm -hmm. The spiritual teacher is there to teach you how to be self-realized, how to understand the techniques, the philosophies, the principles, but then you have to figure out how to live your personal life with all the available resources that, that do exist. Right. So nothing major. There, there wasn't anything major that I disagreed with him on, although I do remember when I wrote the book, um, 
Kriya Yoga Vichara, and I was talking about gurus. Um, I had a chapter in there. Uh, I don't think I've got it here. I'd read it to you. Um, but there was a chapter in that, in that book on gurus where it said, uh, essentially, this is the role of the guru, and you're going to find that they still have their own quirks and idiosyncrasies. And I remember Roy had read that book, and, and the first thing he said when I walked in the door, I saw it sitting on his, uh, on his table by his chair. He said, so what are these quirks and idiosyncrasies that you think I have? <laughs> So anyway, yeah, no, <laughs> that was interesting actually. Yeah. <laughs> so, let's talk about uh, uh, so uh, you are inviting application for the next Kriya Yoga apprenticeship class uh, yes. beginning twenty twenty one. So can you talk about the qualities that you look for in a student? Uh, yeah, and that is you know that is described for people who are interested yeah. um, in the Kriya Yoga apprenticeship program. I did my best to describe this as clearly as possible in the application. So if you go to kriyogaonline.com and you go to the Kriyoga apprenticeship page, um, you read down through that. And then at the very bottom, there's a downloadable thing that you click on that gives you the application. It's like a 12 page application. Mm -hmm. um, but what I personally look for in a student is someone who doesn't need number one, doesn't need a cheerleader. Yeah. doesn't expect me to be the person saying, come on, you got this, keep going. Mm -hmm. When I first got involved, I didn't have a cheerleader. No one had to tell me what to do. I just knew that it was innately important. And the reason I, I, I specify this is because I find this to be true in all things in life. Mm -hmm. For example, when I first started learning to play music, I didn't need anyone to tell me, go play your guitar. I mm -hmm. wanted to play my guitar. And uh, recently living with a teenager now who briefly expressed an interest in learning a musical instrument, I thought, great, I would love for this person to learn the viola. And she said, yeah, I'll take lessons. So I paid for lessons for her and she never practiced. <laughs> and finally, after about two semesters of that, I said, look, um, I'm happy to support you in this because I think music is very important, but I need to hear you practice a little bit yeah. just when you're not in your lesson. Mm -hmm. And uh, she said, well, how much do you think is good? I said, I was trying to be conservative and easy without overwhelming her. Mm -hmm. I said, at least a half hour twice a week. Mm -hmm. And she looked at me and her jaw dropped open. And she said, <laughs> that's almost like a full time, or that's almost like a part time job. And, oh, I, knew, <laughs> and I, I knew at that moment that music was not for her. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so essentially, the, the, the first quality I really look for is the fact that people are, they're inspired by their own whatever uh, mm. to want to practice and want to learn and want to study and want to grow. Mm. Uh, number two, I require and, and wish that they will be dedicated to it, meaning they know that they're going to have to meditate every day, whether they like it or not, that they're going to study this stuff, even when they're not inspired about it. So when it comes to what qualities do I look for, really it's, any, it's the qualities that anyone would want in someone who wants to learn a skill or a trade or uh, anything really, uh, they really want to learn it themselves and they're willing to do whatever it takes to learn. That's what I'm looking for ultimately. Okay, that's that's good. And yeah, your application uh, is quite elaborate. I think you've mentioned everything that possibly yes. one would need, want to know. So yeah, that's pretty, pretty detailed. Uh, Moving on, what is the, like, when you started this, what was the vision for this program? What is the mid-term to long-term goal for this? Um, I didn't have any real long-term goals for it. Mm -hmm. my, my vision essentially was um, I wanted to offer a program that anyone could take from anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. and they didn't have to belong to any group or, or any organization. They didn't have to sign any papers that said, you know, I'm dedicated to this. I wanted, I wanted to have an opportunity for people to learn where they could learn it on their own. Mm -hmm. and, and I found that to be important because while I do feel that, that groups and organizations can be helpful in the beginning, I have often seen where they become detrimental in that um, people become dependent on them. Okay. And this path is very much a personal path. You know, when, when Lahiri Mahasaya began teaching as a householder, he would tell people, don't tell anyone you practice this and don't tell anyone I'm your teacher. You do it on your own for yourself, essentially. Mm -hmm. So my, my vision was to offer a method of learning where people 
could go about their lives doing whatever they need to do for themselves and for others while learning very deeply about how this is done. And again, there was no long-term vision. I just wanted to, to offer this and make it available for as long as it was viable, really. Okay. So, uh, I mean, the next question I have, you already talked about it. So what is your approach to teaching uh, Kriya Yoga and how is it different from Mr. Davis's approach? So if you want to talk about it a little bit more. Yeah, I don't, I don't really think there's any difference. Yeah. Um, the, the only difference is that he liked to get haircuts regularly and I don't. <laughs> um, he, he was very much, he, he was very stylish and I'm uh -huh. not. Uh, so, so it's more superficial things, but when yeah. it comes right down to it, no matter what, ever, ever since I met him, uh, the way he teaches Kriya and the way he present it, presents it, that has always been what I have resonated with. And so um, my, I, don't, I, don't see, I don't feel I don't see any difference in that regard. Um, and I, I do my best because I want to, not because I want to mimic him. Right, but yeah. I, I, I do my best to, to continue that because for me it was extremely valuable. Right. Okay, so moving on to the last question, and this is, again, you've continued the tradition, and if, if one of your students comes to you and, you know, expresses interest in teaching Kriya Yoga to others, what will be your advice to them? And again, what do you think are the qualities that someone needs to be a good, effective teacher? Yeah. Um, well, I'll tell you what Mr. Davis told me uh, from the very beginning. He said that in order to teach this, there are three things that you have to do or you have to be. You have to be mentally, emotionally, and spiritually mature. Mm -hmm. And that's a hard one. <laughs> yes. Um, mentally mature. You think clearly. You think rationally. Mm -hmm. um, you're, you're effective in what you need to do in the world to the best of your ability, barring life circumstances. Um, emotionally mature. You're not dependent on getting satisfaction or, or needs met through others. You are emotionally strong and stable and clear. You don't have a lot of psychological complexes that get in your way. Um, to be spiritually mature, it's really to embody the practices, to do what you say you do, to if you're teaching meditation, that you've meditated, that you do it constantly, that you, you know how to do it, how to explore it. If you've, if you've studied the Yoga Sutras, the Bhagavad Gita, the Sista Yoga, any spiritual text, that you have really taken the time to understand it to the best of your ability. But ultimately, um, the, the, the key to being, uh, in my mind, uh, an effective spiritual teacher is to have a dedication to truth. Because if you have a dedication to truth, then say you're a teacher and really all you can do as, as based on your level is just teach simple basic meditation routines. Well, that's still useful and that's still playing the role of a teacher. But if you're established in truth and someone comes up to you and they have questions for you and they're not something that you have experience in or uh, an understanding of, since you're established in truth, you can say, well, I can't, I can't talk about that because I have not experienced that. Um, I, I, I was ordained very early. I, I was probably, I was 25 when I was ordained. And that was, I think it was way too young. <laughs> um, I was very committed to my process. I was very committed to yoga. I was committed to it all. But I, I didn't have much life experience, really. Right. Um, and so I don't really even feel, and, and this might even change as I get older, I don't even feel like I was a, a very good teacher until probably about 10 or 12 years into the process. Mm -hmm. And I had already been ordained. I'd already been initiated. Now I could teach meditation. I could talk about the philosophy. But when it came to understanding what it's like to be in the human condition, mm -hmm. I didn't have a whole lot of that. Mm -hmm. So um, to be a successful Kriya Yoga teacher, I think people need to have some experience in life, mm -hmm. that they're mature, um, that, they, that they're not doing it to be seen as a teacher. And that's the key. Right. Mm -hmm. Because to be quite fair, um, when students approach me and say they want to be a teacher, I'm less likely to want to make them a teacher. <laughs> Why? It's true. it's true. There are, there are, uh, there are three, three people in the Kriya Yoga Apprenticeship Program right now that mm -hmm. I've already decided that if they stick with it as the years go on, I'm going to bring it up to them. I'm going to say, would you like to be uh, a teacher in this tradition? Mm -hmm. And I think they will do a wonderful job. Why? 
because I know that they don't care about being seen as spiritual or being seen as a spiritual teacher. Mm -hmm. I know that based on talking to them, that they have a good grasp of what it's required to practice Kriya Yoga, and they have a good grasp of the, the philosophy. Mm -hmm. And number three, I know they are sincere, mm -hmm. not just about Kriya Yoga, but they are sincere people in life that I would trust. Right. You know, they're good people. They're not putting on, they're not pretentious. They're not trying to do anything. And I know that if they became teachers, that they would teach people who needed to learn, but they wouldn't be doing it to be defined as a teacher. Mm -hmm. So these are, these, this is the basics, the basic idea uh, of what I would say. Now, it doesn't mean that someone can't approach me and say, I would like to teach this, or okay. I feel, or, or they say, I feel that it is my path. If that is true, I'll step back and I'll examine and see what kind of, a, how they're coming at it. And uh, if it seems sincere, then yeah, we, we still move forward. But right. most of the time, in my mind, I want people to teach that really don't want to be teachers. <laughs> Yeah, no, teaching so, is not easy, yes. Yes. You, you, you have to want to do it no matter what. That's really what it boils down to. You know, given, given, given the opportunity, um, I, I feel very, I, I feel that it is important to teach this stuff. Mm -hmm. Meaning I, I see that there is a need in the world and mm -hmm. I feel it is important to share this stuff. Um, if, if, if everyone stopped coming to the Kriya Yoga Apprenticeship Program, if everyone stopped watching my YouTube videos, reading my books, fine. I wouldn't care. I'd go do something else. Right. But I feel it is important. And so as long as it is supportive, uh, I will continue to do that. And, and I want other people who want to learn to teach this stuff or share this stuff, I want them to have the same kind of approach where they want to do what God wants them to do. Yeah. Which means if God wants them to teach this, they will. And if mm -hmm. then one day it dries up and God says it's time for you to do something else, they'll say, all right, what's most important is being in tune with God, not necessarily being seen as a teacher. Right. So no. anyway, that's the long or short of that answer. Yeah, no, that makes sense. So that was basically the last question I had. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. It was, it was great talking to you. I yeah. was nervous, but then I think it, it went okay. <laughs> yeah, you did fine. I, I appreciate the questions and uh, you know, I do feel they'll probably be helpful to, to other people. And um, again, anyone out there who's in the Kriya Yoga Apprenticeship Program with speaking experience and the ability to organize your thoughts well, if you would like to interview me on the Kriya Yoga Podcast, I don't hesitate to contact me. <laughs> yes. But anyway. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you so yes. much. It was wonderful and I, I hope you have a really good day and keep on meditating. Yeah, you too. Thanks. Take care. Yeah. This episode of the Kriya Yoga podcast was made possible by donations from Kriya Yoga apprenticeship students and supporters of our Patreon community at www.patreon.com forward slash Kriya Yoga.